my beautiful Texas daughter-in-law, my oldest son who was born in Texas, which is the only reason he was allowed to marry a Texan, because I guess that's a thing. Then there is my husband, my youngest son, Arden, who married a girl named Christian, in case he forgets what he is. Then there is me and my beautiful mother-in-law, my third son, look at him very closely, he is single. He is single. I would like that to change. My third son, Alexander. My second son, Austin, who is married to Jessica. And I already mentioned that I am a grandmother, but you need to know I'm not just any kind of grandmother. I am a Sicilian grandmother. Do I have any Sicilians here? There's usually like three. Okay, hallelujah. There's like two there. Okay, so there's a difference between Italians and Sicilians. Italians will feed you. Sicilians might kill you. We are the ones that gave the world the mafia. You're welcome. Every tribe and every people group has a contribution, and that was ours. Sicilians are Greeks, Arabs, and Italians mixed. You all need to pray for my husband. Anyway, so I am a, a little bit of a passionate package. I loved how Justin was talking about we need to be passionate. So what I'm going to do in my time period with you this afternoon and then tonight is I'm going to be your Sicilian godmother. And I don't believe that one generation has to learn the hard way what the last generation already learned the hard way. And when I was praying about what to bring, I, I felt really bad. The media people are like, we hate you. Because I, I was like, I don't want to turn my message in yet. I want to get there and kind of figure out what I want to speak on. But I can already tell that you guys are here because you believe there is something more. And that's something more. Actually, when I find God, I say, I want more of you. He answers back, I want more of you. He always makes that exchange. It's not a, I'm going to give him something and then it's going to pay for something. It's a capacity issue. And the more we want of God, the more he needs of us. I have had the privilege of traveling and speaking on some of the biggest platforms in the world, but that is not what God called us to do. He did not call us into the ministry to be speakers. He called us into the ministry to be ministers of the gospel of reconciliation and to make disciples, not celebrities. And so I want to talk to you about why it is so important that we talk about this. There is more. There is signs and there's wonders and there's miracles, but right now the greatest sign and the wonder and the miracle would be for the church to actually love one another well, for the church to actually live well, because the greatest platform any of us will ever stand on is not a stage, it is our life. And if I do not love my husband well, if I do not love my children well, then there is going to be a disconnect. Now, how many of you, I, I talked to some grandmothers and mothers already, if you can throw up the family picture one more time, you're going to see a little girl on the end there, and that is Lizzie. Now, I want to talk to you about Lizzie. I don't know how many of you grew up with a mother that threatened you and would say things like, I hope you have a daughter just like you. And I was not smart, and so I would answer back, I hope I have a daughter just like me too. Then I became a Christian, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just go for all boys. I don't even want a girl. I'm going to go all boys. And so this daughter that was just like me came in the form of a granddaughter named Lizzie. And when you have done that to your sweet Texas daughter-in-law, who is like Audrey Hepburn, and you are a spaz, then you have to write a children's book. So I'm going to just tell you, I've got a children's book out there, because how many of you know that children do not follow what we say? They follow what we model. How many of your kids come home from school and you're like, how was your day? And what did they say? Fine. Yes, they always say fine. Four o'clock, fine. Then at the dinner table, I would say to my boys, let's do high-low. What was your favorite thing about today? And my boys would all look at me. And they're like, we're not going to do this for you. But then when I was putting them to bed at night, they would want to unburden their soul. And I'm like, I got nothing now. And so I created a book that if you can just still read, then you can have the conversations that we're going to need to have with a generation. Because courage does not happen in isolation. Courage happens in community. And we're going to have to tell the next generation that sometimes the most courageous thing you can do is to ask for help. So does anybody here have a Lizzie in their life? I want you to wave at me, okay? You right there, come on up here. Come on up, I'm gonna give you a book. 
See, now you all are going to pay more attention, aren't you? Because now you're like, oh, there's free stuff. Okay, here you go. You are most welcome. And this is not, I'm not going to talk about children's stories, but I do believe that God is a generational God. And I'm going to talk to you about something that I think you need to hear. First and foremost, we are in a battle zone. And I don't know what happened, but for a long time now, there's been a generation that thinks they can be heroes without a battle. And we were not created for a time that is small and safe. We were created for this time that is going to demand courage, a time that is perilous. And I'm going to read a scripture to you that I believe needs to be a mandate for people who believe there is more. Matthew 10, verses 26 through 28, I'm going to read it out of the message. It says, don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open, and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There is nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul, in his hands. This is a time to fear God. This is a time to tremble at his word. This is a time to not be intimidated. There is a spirit of intimidation that is after the gift of God that is on your life. So don't be afraid to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence. The enemy is after your voice. See, I don't think you understand that you have been entrusted with a heavenly language. See, I really hope that next year when I get my Italian citizenship, because I am getting it, I'll have a dual citizenship, Italian and US, I'm really hoping that I'm gonna get a phone call and they're gonna say to me, I understand that your real name is Lisa Toscano and I'm gonna be like, yes, that is true. Well, we didn't know how to find you, but now that you're an Italian citizen, we need to tell you that you have a villa on the island of Sicily. You need to come and you need to claim your villa. I would be so excited. I would tell all my boys, add a hyphen to your name, be Bevere Toscano, you need to have that name because we have a villa. And then I would get in my car and I would drive to the Apple store. Why? I would want to get the Rosetta Stone. Why? Because I would need to know the language of my second home. But you and I have a greater language than a language of our second home. We have been entrusted with the language of our eternal home. And you and I must become fluent in the Word of God because the Word of God, when it is spoken by His children, has the ability to shift and shape and cut and remake everything. We need to be a people who understand that we have been anointed for this time to speak prophetically, earth, earth, hear ye the word of the Lord. And so you have to know what the word of God is because we have a lot of things in our culture right now that sound right and feel wrong. You have to know why that feels wrong. You have to know the truth with a greater intimacy than this world knows the lie. And we know that Jesus Christ is not just one of the ways. He's not just the best way. He is the only way. Jesus Christ is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And we live in a culture that says, but you can have your truth and I can have my truth. And up there, there can be another truth, and next week I might feel different about the truth. Well, no, you can have a story, and I can have a story, but the truth does not change. I'm going to tell you a little secret. This morning, I got up, and I looked in the mirror, and I saw some truth. I saw about an inch of gray hair coming out of the top of my head, and I said, no, no. The truth is, I will not be able to take care of that till Sunday. So what did I do? I took some spray, cover the roots of my hair. So what is true of me right now is I got some gray hair. But on Sunday, that will no longer be true of me. That's not true. That's true of. That is a circumstantial thing. What is true of me right now is I've got four grandkids. What I hope will be true of me in five years is that I have 10 to 20 grandkids. So true of changes. 
but Jesus doesn't change. And we have a culture that is trying to change the Word of God. We have a culture that is saying that truth is a river, that we've evolved. Really? Do you see the behavior of our culture right now? You think this is rising to a level of godliness and revelation? No, we are actually demeaning ourselves and have forgotten that we are children of God. God does not change. Micah says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. And then the rest of that verse says, lest I consume you. So God is God that says, I have decided that I have loved you with an everlasting love. And that's a good thing because, because God doesn't change, you and I can change. Scott Peck said the whole course of human history may depend on a change of heart in one solitary and even humble individual. For it is the solitary mind and soul of the individual that the battle between good and evil is waged and ultimately won or lost. Won or lost. Every day is a battle to win or lose. Christianity is a battle, not a dream. And if you and I are going to be brave enough to dream, we must be brave enough to fight. Second Timothy chapter three, I'm gonna read from the Passion Translations verses one through four describes our day. In the final days, the culture of society will sink so low into degradation that it will be extremely difficult for the people of God. People will be self-centered, lovers of themselves, obsessed with money. They will boast of great things as they strut around in their arrogant pride and mock all that is right. They will ignore their own families. They will be ungrateful and ungodly. They will become addicted to hateful and malicious slander. Oh, that sounds like Twitter. Slaves to their own desires. They will be ferocious, belligerent haters of what is good and right. With brutal treachery, they will act without restraint, bigoted and wrapped in clouds of conceit. They will find their delight in the pleasures of this world more than the pleasures of loving God. The struggles of our world, I know everything gets blamed on President Trump. The struggles of our word are not the Republicans. It is not white supremacy. It is not racism. It is not gun control. The troubles of our word is the darkened condition of the human heart. And the darkened condition of the human heart gives way to racism, gives ways to white supremacy, gives ways to everything that is divided. But the real struggle is something that we can win because we understand that Jesus gives us a new heart and a willing spirit. So our struggle arrives when a nation turns from worshiping God. Romans 1, 21 says, what happened was this. It's talking about the confusion. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but they were illiterate regarding life. We absorb ceaseless amounts of information and yet lack tangible, measurable transformation. Families are broken, marriages are fractured, justice is corrupted, teachers are hindered from being able to educate, evil is called good, good is called evil, lies are broadcast as truth, Leaders fall, children are afraid, women are violated, ministers lose faith, and far too many have compromised their integrity. Actors, performers are our heroes and role models. At best, our earth is sick and wounded, and our global environment teeters in the balance. And as if we didn't have enough evidence that perhaps our current decisions are wrong. We continue to research and gather more data. But I would propose we are looking for answers we have already been given. Have we lost our way or have our willful choices led us into a place of foolishness? Our generation has deliberately left paths of light to explore, explore recesses of darkness and when that happens, we are often too smart to find our way back home. Romans 1.26 says, Worse followed, refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women, 
and men didn't know how to be men. Listen, God is looking to this and he's saying, I need you to remember that male and female is not a power struggle. Male and female is a power union. God needs women to be women and men to be men. And God needs us to remember the strength of what it is to be a woman and the strength of what it is to be a man. And we have lost that strength and we have looked as women to the men and said, you need to heal our brokenness. And the men have looked to the women and said, you need to heal our brokenness. But the wrestling between the genders will never heal the brokenness. The healing that we need can only come from God. And so we need to lean in to understanding that the church has not always done what Randy mentioned at the beginning. It has not always valued its daughters. And when you don't value somebody in the correct way, they will go outside to try to find their purpose and value somewhere else. But we are not foolish women who imagine that the men are our problem, nor that the men are our answers. We believe that God is our answer. And so together we're going to remember that it wasn't about the woman not having a voice or the man not having a voice. It was about the man and the woman both using their voice on the serpent. And we are going to be a people who say it is written. Instead of talking about what has been done, we are going to prophesy what God will do. We are going to be a generation that will stand on the face of earth and release the words of heaven. I believe that God is raising up an army that will not make it about them. My husband is, is, is a visionary. How many of you are married to visionaries? It's scary. It's really, really scary. So I kind of get scared when John has time on his hands. If he's traveling and speaking, I'm like, great. It's going to be status quo. But when my husband gets alone with God for a while, he'll go outside and pray for a couple hours and he will come back in and I have like a Moses face. And I'm like, what's going on with that face? What's going to happen? You're going to do something scary. Aren't you? You'll be like, I'm just pondering some stuff. I'm like, I need you to stop pondering. I need you to debrief. Stop pondering. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk about some things. And John's like, no, no, I'm just going to, I'm just going to think about some stuff. I feel like the spirit of God's just talking to me. And I'm like, well, then talk to me. He's like, no, not yet. Not yet. I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to wait till we're all together around a table. So my husband gathered all of us at a table. And I think this was in 2000 and Seven, and he said to me, Lisa and the team, it has come to my heart to give away 250,000 books. I immediately threw up in my mouth. I was like, excuse me? Wait, no, that's, that's what you do in an upturn economy. You don't do that in a downturn economy. And John was like, yeah, I just feel like we should give away 250. So I said, okay, what, what's the most we've ever given away in a year? So our accountant was like 100,000, I mean 60,000. I said, okay, good, good. Let's do a 40% increase. Let's give away 60, I mean 100,000, and that'll be a big increase. So my husband looked at me and he made a fist and his fist went up in the air and it came down on the table and he said, Lisa, my faith is attached to 250 thousand books. At that point, I said, 250, it's a great number. 250,000, that's a great number. So what did we do? We stood up, and I need you to hear me. We stood up, we joined hands, and we prayed a prayer that scared what was scared inside of us. Wow. See, the truth is, most Christians do not pray prayers that scare them when it comes out of their mouth. They pray scared prayers. God, keep my money safe. God, keep my children safe. God, keep my marriage safe. You cannot pray like that any longer. You have to pray in such a way. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. It's not a safe prayer. That is a take territory prayer. And so that year we gave away 250,000 books. Actually, it was in 2011. And now to date, we've given away 22 million books and resources in 111 languages, which goes to 97 nations. I don't know what would have happened if John would have listened to me. If John would have listened to me and said, you know what, Lisa, you're right. It's a downturn economy. You're right, we've only given away 60,000. You're right, we'll do 100,000. 
I bet we'd still be trying to figure out how to pay for it. See, God wants a people who understand that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. And God is behind people getting resources that make disciples. What is your scary prayer? What is that thing that you are praying for? See, I'm the answer to a scared prayer when it came to my mom. My mom looked at me, she had my brother who was seven years younger. He was a Christian, I think when he was four. I was an exceptional heathen. I said, I am going to be all out for the devil. And so at 21 years of age, my mother prayed. She was like, could she just not go to hell? Could she just get converted on her deathbed? And I remember there was a word of prophecy at my mom's little Bible study. And they said, your daughter is going to get born again, filled with the Holy Spirit and called into the ministry. And my mom said, that's impossible. That's like, seriously, that's probably for Joey. That is not for Lisa. Lisa just needs to not go to hell. That's all I'm concerned about with Lisa. So I was my mom's scary prayer. What is your scary prayer? Because I think a lot of you have compromised. A lot of you have listened to the downgrade that. And God is asking you to do the exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask, hope, pray, or believe, and you refuse to ask. You refuse to ask because you have known disappointment and because you have known disappointment you have decided that you will not dream i need you to dream again i need you to actually against hope believe in hope i need you to write some things down and declare some things out first generation christian first generation christian means that john and i did a lot of things wrong by accident and a few things right by accident one of the things I did right by accident was that when my children were little, I lined them up every single night. And I would say, you are for signs and wonders and miracles. You are not for death and destruction. You are disciples taught of the Lord and great is your peace and undisturbed composure. My kids were like, what's composure? I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you need it, you'll have it. What was I doing? I was creating a larger world for my children than anybody had ever created for me. A lot of times you're looking at your life and thinking, why didn't God answer my prayers? Well, maybe he's answering it in your children or your children's children. Three of my four sons have book contracts. I expect all of them to be New York Times bestselling authors. I expect all of them to do better than John and I, because since they were very little, we have spoken over them a larger world. You have to speak a larger world over yourself, a larger world over your children, a larger world over your children's children. What did I say? They will not follow what you say. They will follow what you model. And so you need to live in that larger world. And there is more means there is more surrender. Take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. What does that mean to take up our cross? What does that mean? It's like a Christian thing. Take up your cross. You know, I remember I was taking care of my mom. She, she's gone on to heaven now, but I was taking care of her. She'd had multiple strokes, which was a, a very hard season for her. I, a lot of times she would have like collapse between the bed and the bathroom, and I would have to stay up to 2 a.m. in the morning just to make sure she was in the bed and safe. And during that season, God was like, and you're gonna write a book. I'm like, really? This seems like a joke. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, I was just falling asleep, and I don't know if he does this to you, but God will speak to me as I'm waking up and as I'm falling asleep. He'll whisper things to me in that time between times. And I heard him say to me, what does it mean to carry your cross? And I thought, okay, okay, Matthew 16, 24, deny myself, take up my cross, follow me, okay. It means to lay down my life. He was like, no, that means deny yourself. What does it mean to take up your cross? And I was like, I really don't feel like this is a 2 a.m. conversation. I really feel like this is a 10 a.m. conversation. I'm not sure why you're asking me these questions at 2 a.m. But earlier that day, I had done a poll because I knew I was going to miss Easter because I was caregiving my mom. And how many of you know that actually is more important 
than me going to church. Okay, you can do online church, but family should be first. So anyway, I was missing, gonna miss Easter service. And so I had to ask people, what one word does the cross mean to you? And I got a ton of responses from people. People said things, safety, grace, salvation, mercy, love. And I was looking for a word, actually, that nobody gave me. And I was wondering if I, weird, which I am, uh, I was wondering if my thought process was strange, which it is, but I was hoping that there was one other strange person out there that would be looking for the same word. And I had compiled a list of like 37 words, and I had handwritten it. Then I realized my handwriting was horrible, so I was typing it out, healing, strength, all these different things. And when I got to the last word, I heard the Holy Spirit say, behold the cross. He said, all that the cross provides for you is what you carry out into your ordinary, everyday world, and you do it by following me. See, Jesus isn't looking for your sacrifice. He's looking for your obedience. And what he has done in your life becomes the cross that you carry. It is not a burden. It is something that we lift up. So I'll tell you some of the things I carry on my life. He healed me of an eating disorder. He healed me of lactose intolerance. He set me free from seriously major demons, from promiscuity, from my past. He redeemed my marriage. He gave me strength. I he broke generational curses. And so all of these different things that he has done in my life is what I lift up for other people. I don't know what the cross is that you carry out, but somebody needs to hear what Jesus has done in your life because you are a living, breathing example, an epistle known and read by people, but you gotta tell them what he has done in your life. There are people waiting to hear what he has done in your life. And when you look at the cross, it's amazing to me. It looks like a sword with a point in the ground. I believe that's because it's how God said this is finished. It says when God made his promise to Abraham, he kept it to the hilt. Do you know what the hilt is? The crossbar of a sword. Jesus was the hilt of the cross. He said, all is forgiven. All are welcome. Everything that the Father had in me, I give to you. Do you know that Jesus didn't just lend us his name? Do you know he gave us his name? Do you know that Jesus has a new name? It's tattooed on his thigh. I know that stresses everybody out, but that's what it says. It says he's got a new name, but we have not used his name to the fullness. See, when we only preach that the cross is salvation, we're diminishing the power of the cross because the cross is salvation, but it is also healing. It is also deliverance. It is also mercy. It is also grace. And the weapon that I was looking for was the word weapon because there is no greater weapon than a life laid down. We need to remember that we do not have a sword of the Spirit to beat people up. We have the sword of the Spirit to set people free. So we need to watch how we use the word in these last days. Okay, I wanted to read to you from uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's, yeah, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 10. Because if we're going to be there as more people, we need to understand what's going on. It opens up with companions as we are in this work with you. We beg you, please do not squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen. The day to be helped, don't put it off. Don't frustrate God by showing up late, throwing a question mark over everything we're doing. Our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post, alertly, unswervingly, in hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, jailed, mobbed, unfollowed on Facebook, working hard, working late, working without eating, with pure heart, clear head, steady hand, in gentleness, holiness, honest love, when we're telling the truth and what God's showing us power, when you're doing our best, setting things right, when we're praised, when we're blamed, when we're slandered, honored, true to our word, though distrusted, ignored by the world, but recognized by God, terrifically alive, though rumored to be dead, beaten with an inch of our lives, we're refusing to die, immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy. 
living on handouts, yet enriching many, having nothing, having it all. That is what the life of there is more looks like through acts of faith. They toppled kingdoms, made justice work, and took the promises for themselves. Now, you may not know much about me, but I lost an eye to cancer when I was five years of age. This eye right here is plastic. So imagine what would be one of my greatest fears, doing what I'm doing right now. Getting up in front of other people and public speaking was enough to set me into absolute terror. But see, God loves to actually make you face what you fear. Because when you face what you fear, you become fearless. And God is not interested in anointing another generation where they are strong. He's going to anoint us in the areas where we are weak so he can show himself strong. God had to have a violent, intense wake-up call with me. I had a dream when I was pregnant with my fourth son. And when I was pregnant with my fourth son, I had a dream and I saw this magnificent lioness. She was laying on top of a platform of stone and the words Numbers 23, and it was in Roman numerals XX3, were on the front of it. And I heard a voice say, with the birth of the son, you will awaken a lioness. I remember thinking, wait, just a minute, what, what just happened? Have you, ever, have you ever woken immersed in the presence of God? It doesn't happen to me very often. I woke this morning and I did not know where I was. I was laid in my hotel bed for just a little bit, like 30 seconds, like this is not my house, where am I? Then I was like, okay, I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. It can take me hours to wake up. I love espresso, so I will wake up slowly every single morning. I had the privilege of traveling around the world with Hillsong, women's conference and I started in Sydney then I went to South Africa then I went to Ukraine then I went to England and on the last day of the conference I stumbled out of my bed in London and headed across the street to the Starbucks that I believe Jesus put there just for me and I was usually the first person in line but that particular morning somebody was in line in front of me and when she turned around she looked at me and then she really looked at me and that's when I remembered that I had toothpaste on my face because I had read in a beauty magazine that if you put toothpaste on your face, it'll dry out blemishes overnight. And so I had taken Triple Fresh Aqua Fresh, put it on my face in like 11 places. I noticed when I rode down the elevator with the British couple, they had looked at me weird but I thought, they just don't like Americans. And I noticed as I walked through the lobby, the concierge tried to get my attention, but I just waved at him. Now I'm face to face with another one of the speaker's mothers and she's uncomfortable. She doesn't know whether she should tell me that I have toothpaste on my face. And so I, I felt like I should just say, yes, I, I have toothpaste on my face, don't I? And she said, yes, you do. So I do not wake fully, but that particular morning, all of my senses were on high alert. And I opened up my Bible to Numbers 23. And this is what I read in verse 24. The people rise like a lioness. They rouse themselves like a lion who does not rest till it drinks its prey, and eats its prey and drinks the blood of its victims. I'm like, I am almost a vegetarian. What do these fierce words on fragile Bible pages have to do with me? But I did give birth to a son. He's my fourthborn. And I named him Arden Christopher. Arden means fiery and determined. Christopher means anointed one. And with his birth, everything in my life began to change. I later wrote a book called Lioness Arising. And I remember I was driving in my car and the book was already out in five languages. When I prayed, I said, God, I've written a book called Lioness Arising. It's in five languages. I realized I probably should have prayed before and asked you if it was okay. I wrote the book, but it's out. So you're independent of time. Can you confirm this for me that I did the right thing? So I'm thinking that I would never have to like publicly admit that I had prayed after. And so that night, I'm in the throes of a school project with my youngest son. 
I don't know if you, down in the south you'll understand this, but I live in Colorado. There was a blizzard, and it's eight o'clock at night, and my youngest son said, Mom, I just remembered, I have a school project due tomorrow. So what did I do? I went into the basement, I tore apart the three older boys' school projects, brought him the poster board, and he said, nope, it's not the right format, it has to be trifold, and it has to be black. So I braved the blizzard, paid my other kids money so that they would work on his project. One's cutting out pictures, the other one's typing what he dictates. I come home out of the blizzard, it's all spread out, chaos on the table. When John Bevere does what he used to do all the time, that I used to call annoying, that I now call cute. John called me, and he puts me on the phone with strangers. He, he, I don't know if it's an exit strategy, if he gets uncomfortable, and he's like, here, talk to my wife. So he is calling me, and I'm like, I cannot talk to your random stranger right now, John. I am doing a school project with your son. You wouldn't know what that's like because you're never here for the school projects. And John said, I know, I know, I knew you were going to be busy, so I gave him your cell number. So about an hour and a half later, this guy calls, and, and I answered the phone, and I tried to sound really tired. I'm like, hello. And he said, is this Lisa Bevere? And I'm like, yes. He said, well, your husband held up your book, Lioness Arising, and he said that lions are the best killers, but lionesses are the best hunters. And I said, well, of course he would say that. That's all he knows. He hasn't read the book. And he said, well, I'm calling you to tell you why your book is important. And I was like, okay. He said, do you know we're not winning the war in, a, in, in Iraq? And I said, in Afghanistan. And I said, yes, I actually did know we're not winning the war. He said, do you want to know why we're not winning the war in Afghanistan? I said, yes, in the middle of my son's school project, I must know why the United States of America is not winning the war. He said, well, we're not winning the war because we can't speak to the women. And he said, when you can't speak to the women, you can't flip the culture. And when you can't flip the culture, you can't win the war. He said, let me tell you what I do here at Fort Bragg. He said, I am in charge of special operative teams. He said, up until this point, we've only sent in special operative men because of the dangers in Afghanistan. But now we're going to send in special operative women and they are going to tell the Afghan women they have voice and value. They're going to tell them why democracy will serve their sons and daughters well. They're going to deliver their babies and take care of their minor medical needs. I'm like, this is all wonderful. And he said, do you want to know the name of this group? I said, I would love to know it. He said, it's called Team Lioness. He said, they're about ready to be deployed. Can I have a copy of your book for all of them? So I outfitted all of Team Lioness going out of camp uh, Fort Bragg and then also Camp Lejeune. Why am I telling you this? Because if there is going to be more, we need to understand that it's going to take both men and women. Because without the involvement of women, you will fight, but you will never win. And I want to show you a picture. I have a picture of two lions face to face, head to head. Because this is what the enemy does not want. He does not want male and female in positions of strength. He wants the men dominating the women and the women manipulating the men. But God has never intended that to be it. God wants us face to face. And lions are not trying to be lionesses and lionesses are not trying to be lions. They understand the lioness holds the land and the lion protects the lioness. So if there is going to be more, we got to go back to our very Genesis. We got to remember that God made the man and the woman for dominion. Dominion. And Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, not just the lost. So we have to live and preach the gospel to everything that has been lost. We have to preach it to lost marriages. We have to preach it to families that are broken, parents and children where something that was lost. Brother to brother is racism. Sister to sister is seriously gender hatred among women. So many women hate the fact that they're a woman because they believe they'd be more powerful if they were a man. But that is a lie. God wove you in your mother's womb to be a powerful woman and you would not have more influence or strength if you were a man. You were woven in wonder for this season and for this day. And so we have to remember what we started with. We've gone back to season 
of influence, a season of dominion, which means I exercise authority on behalf of those under my care. We got to change this whole empire mentality and get a kingdom mentality. A kingdom means that I have authority and strength so that I can lift other people into their gifting and their authority and strength. An empire is everything comes down from me and everything goes up to me, but we are not emperors. We are kingdom children. And so we need to shift this mentality, but we need to do it first in a healing between the genders. We need to do it first in our healing between one another. We need to stop our words of judgment. I know it's hard right now to be a charismatic. I know that being a charismatic is like equal to saying you're crazy. You know, it's true. But here's the challenge that we have. Somebody captured it on my social media the best way I've ever said. They said, we have one side of the church that is railroad tracks with no locomotives. And we have the other side of the church that is locomotives without any railroad tracks. We need to have both the word and the spirit. We need to have things in order. We need to have clarity. We need to have direction. We can't be all over the place because when God begins to pour out his spirit in the last days, it's not at all about falling and shaking and taking laps. When he poured out his spirit on the early church, none of them fell. Do you know what happened? He said there was a infusion of courage. The people that were uneducated began to speak with great boldness and they would say, how is it that these unlearned fishermen are speaking the word of God with great boldness? It put metal in their frames, it put strength in their stance. They decided to not be intimidated. So as somebody who lived their entire life from five years old until 35 intimidated, I feel like I have authority over that spirit of intimidation. So can I get everybody to stand up? I'm going to lead you in dealing with that spirit of intimidation that is after the gift of God on your life. Dealing with that spirit of intimidation that wants to silence your voice. Dealing with that spirit of intimidation that says compromise your dream. When God is saying, I need you to actually dream way larger. Spirit of intimidation that is saying because you had an impure past, you will not have a virtuous future. That's a lie. You are not your past. You are not that story. God wants to redeem it and he wants to use what you had as a struggle in your past as a freedom for other people in the future. So I want you to say it out loud with me. Say, Father, Father you have not given me, not given a, me spirit a spirit of fear, but a spirit, but a spirit of love, of love power, power, and a sound mind. A sound mind. I, refuse I refuse to listen to, listen to the limiting counsel, the limiting counsel of, fear. of fear. 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 You give horrible advice. You make me selfish. You shrink my world. You deny the power of God. So I am not going to repeat your lies. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to become fluent in the language that created everything that I see. I'm going to speak swords. I'm going to sing swords. I'm going to carry my cross like a hero. I'm going to wake up like a lion. I'm going to rouse myself. I'm going to take responsibility for my own freedom. Because I believe that Jesus did it all. So in Jesus' name, I break intimidation. No, you need to say it stronger than that. Say, I break intimidation. I, break intimidation. I, refuse, I refuse to live in its confines. Live in its confines. And, I and I speak to the gift of God in my life. Put your hand here. Say, gift of God. Gift of God. Wake, up. Wake up. Be stirred up. Be stirred up. You will no longer will be, dormant be dormant or oppressed. Or oppressed. You are not just for me. You, are you were me. given to set other people free. So I'm going to be a good steward with the gift. I'm going to write. I'm going to prophesy. I'm going to read the word. I'm going to pray prayers that scare me. I'm going to do things instead of just think things. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Your special ops. Your special ops people. I believe that. I believe that God has special operations for you. I believe you're here for special equipping. I believe that you are not here just to get a word for you, but that you are here to actually find out that you are a word, that you are a message, that everywhere you go, you are declaring the living, breathing resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to remember what he has done in your life. I want you to declare it with great boldness. I want you to believe that you are not content with what you have seen. I am not content with what I have known. I am not content with a generation not seeing the power of God. I am not content with the church being known as weird and fragmented. I am not content with this being the end of our story. I am not content with gender confusion. I am not content with high divorce rates. I am not content with powerless Christian life. I am not content. And as a grandmother, I have a hard time seeing things that are up close. But in the distance, I see a glorious uprising for the church of Jesus Christ. So don't you dare be content. Lean into everything that God has. In Jesus' name. Amen.